It's my pleasure to introduce David Van Dyke of the Department of Mathematics and Imperial College London, where he is the chair of physics. Uh, David is no stranger, though, to Harvard, having been here not too long ago, and currently as an active participant of this international Chask. Can you say Chask? Okay. I, do. I didn't know. I didn't know if I was saying the acronym or to actually spell it out. <laughs> Chask, uh, this astrophysical collaboration. Uh, which you've heard about in, in many of the other talks of the series. And so today, David will be telling us about science-driven models for image analysis in astronomy and solar physics. And it's a highlight talk, and so it'll be a full length uh, for the five-minute talk, after which we'll have, of course, the pizza. So with that, <laughs> let's uh, welcome you. Now, probably I'll only be talking about the solar physics part of this. I have two examples to go through, but I, I, I just think that's overly ambitious. So I think I'll go slowly through one of them instead of, you know, whiz through two. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is, uh, you know, the world that we're living in with massive data sets, big data, data science. Uh, we all know that there's kind of lots of opportunities for uh, people who are interested in data uh, because there's so much more data around. Uh, data quality and quantity leads to better science and from a statistician's point of view, more interesting statistical work to do. Um, it doesn't really matter if... You, already a question. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And, and feel free to interrupt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so anyway, so it, it doesn't really matter if you're an astronomer or a statistician, if you're working on Wall Street or Google, or if you're a social scientist, you're probably thinking uh, a little bit about how new tools for data science might inform your work and your help you, you know, in your ability to analyze your interesting and maybe large or complex data sets. And so uh, I'm going to go through this example uh, 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 for image analysis in solar physics. Um, but along the way, I kind of want to think a little bit about that kind of bigger question uh, and think about the, the, the kind of there's this um, a couple of dimensions that we can talk about data driven models versus science driven models, for example, where kind of on the extreme end of data driven science, uh, the idea is to build algorithms that you can kind of apply in principle um, to any data set without really knowing anything about where the data set came from or what the objective of the data analysis is. Now that seems to a statistician a bit of an odd or silly uh, objective and folks who have that kind of objective maybe haven't seen the diversity of data sets that some people maybe in this room have. Um, so there's, but that's kind of a, a way of thinking about data science, data-driven science, data-driven methods versus science-driven uh, methods where really you have to think about the question you're interested in, you have to think about uh, the way that the data was uh, generated and you kind of tailor a, maybe a statistical model, maybe it's an astronomical model, maybe you have to tailor your code uh, in some particular way, but everything is very particular to the particular problem you're, you're, or the particular data analysis even that you're working on. And so those are kind of two extremes, and maybe what we want to try to do is see if we can kind of bridge that gap a little bit and leverage some of the new all-purpose methodology, but, to, but while still tailoring it to a particular science uh, problem that we're interested in. Another way we can think about this is predictive models versus descriptive models. So predictive models means that you want to predict the next data point, essentially. Um, so if you're, a, if you're working at Google and you want to figure out which ad you have to uh, put up on my browser that will make me most likely to click on it, um, you probably don't really care at all why I click on it, just so long as you can predict which ad I will click, right? Because then you get your fraction of a cent and you're happy. Whereas, you know, if you're an astronomer, maybe, uh, there's, there's, more to, there's often more to problems than simply prediction. You want to understand the mechanisms uh, that generated the data. Uh, so predictive, that's what I would call a descriptive model. So the model is actually trying to describe the data generation pro, uh, process. And I would argue even if you are primarily interested in prediction, uh, often we'll find, at least in the kinds of problems that show up in you know, my work, in astronomy, uh, that even if you're interested in prediction, uh, understanding the science that and the descriptive and being able to describe the processes that generate the data might aid your prediction. Uh, so that's, you know, we'll kind of see that a little bit in the, the particular example I'm going through today. 
Um, so, you know, the way I'm talking about this, you know, I'm a statistician, so I tend to live over here with descriptive models and science-driven methods. Uh, but there's trade-offs. Um, it tends, if you live over here, you tend to be more principled, uh, have more principled science, uh, more principled statistical methods, but they tend to be a lot more costly both in times of designing the methods, you know, so human capital, and also in computational time. So again, if insofar as we can go a little bit in this direction to kind of massively or significantly improve on the, uh, the costs, so reduce the cost, computational costs and human costs, while not giving up too much uh, in terms of um, the underlying principles in science, that might be a, a, you know, a good trade-off. Uh, of course, these issues aren't unique to astronomy. Uh, maybe that last bullet is a bullet that I put on this slide because I sometimes talk to statisticians. If it's probably fine with you if it's unique to astronomy. <laughs> so um, at the bottom, I, I work, we, uh, as was just mentioned, the, the Chask International Center for Astrostatistics, and also we have a similar center now uh, 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 at, at Imperial College where I am now. Um, so I, I have in, had in mind to go through these two examples. Um, instead, I'm going to probably just focus on the one. Um, this is a, a slide, again, just to describe some of the data challenges, the, the, the depth and quantity of the data in astronomy. The only thing I want to mention here is that I think it's one of the things I really like to emphasize to just about anyone I talk to is that when people talk about big data, they're often really missing the point. Maybe context for the, 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 what's really unique about the data now is its size. But I think in, in many, many situations, at least in scientific settings, that's not, that completely misses the point. Uh, the, the, the depth, the complexity, and the richness of the data that allows us to think about questions that we were not able to think about at all before uh, is not because of the size of the data, really. Um, so the bigness is part of the, part of the equation, but it kind of misses the point. Anyway, so let's go on uh, to the, the particular example. We're going to be looking at um, trying to uh, kind of quantify thermal structure in the solar corona. Um, of course, the corona is the, you know, the highest atmosphere of the sun, uh, very hot region, violent uh, energetic region, characterized by sunspots, flares, and massive sol uh, coronal mass ejections. Um, you know, we like to talk about uh, why we're interested in this stuff, especially when you're talking to kind of non-specialists, is that these solar storms can have uh, effects on Earth-based infrastructure, especially satellites and communication systems. Um, our ultimate goal is to track solar activity and uh, with the ultimate goal, <laughs> the ultimate, ultimate goal of being able to predict this sort of activity. We're not uh, there yet by any means, but that's, that's where, we, where we'd like to go. And so in, in some ways, this is largely a prediction problem, but as I'll, I'll, des as I'll describe it, we'll be very much interested in doing more than just prediction along the way. So trying to understand what's going on in the solar corona that leads to these uh, um, uh, kind of events. So our current goal is to simply characterize structure in the thermal activity and leave prediction uh, it, kind of for future work. I should say this is joint work with a bunch of people uh, who have been at Harvard uh, or are at Harvard, including Vinay, who's here now. Um, uh, again, this is the last little bit that I say that is mostly for people who aren't, who aren't astronomers, but I, I, I just, if you haven't heard this story, it's kind of a great story about the, you know, the, the last big uh, uh, geomag geomagnetic storm in 1859 that caused you know, essentially worldwide aurora. Uh, aurora. Um, you know, gold miners thought it was morning, telegraphic machines failed or continued to shock their operators even when they were unplugged and throwing sparks and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and you just imagine what would happen if there was a storm like this, you know, 160 years later where we're a little bit more dependent on this sort of, uh, you know, electronic infrastructure than we were in 1859. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's real reasons to be interested in this kind of uh, prediction, um, even if these events are, are you know, rare. Um, so uh, the data that we'll be looking at is data from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, of course, launched in 2010 produces massive data streams, 1.4 ter terabytes per day. Uh, what's kind of, you know, how is this, the main characteristics of this data is that it's very high resolution spatial, so you get great images. Um, high resolution temporal as well, so you can kind of make movies. Uh, but it's relatively low uh, spectral resolution, was about, I guess it's seven um, kind of color bands. And I have six of them there, just to make my picture a little bit nicer. Um, and there's white light and uh, magnetic Gram images. We won't be talking about the magnetograms today, though. 
Um, and what we want to do is to go from these six or seven images of the sun uh, in different color bands to being able to uh, find regions of the sun that have similar thermodynamic activity. And the way that we're going to quantify that is via uh, the diffuse, uh, the differential, I'm sorry, emission measure, the DEM. Uh, and uh, Vinay has been trying to teach me how to say exactly what a DEM is for a long time. So um, I'll say it <laughs> now in a, in a, a non-precise way, uh, which is essentially, I just think of the, about the DEM as you know, characterizing the distribution of the temperature of a plasma. And we're going to be looking at, at this pixel-wise. Uh, so we have kind of a, a column of plasma of the, in the solar corona that appears in a particular pixel of the instrument. And that plasma will have, you know, uh, different bits of it of different, at different temperatures. And we want to try to understand that the distribution of, of the plasma within that pixel, that, that appears within that pixel. Um, of course, now what we actually can observe is really uh, only the color. Uh, the amount of plasma, uh, or the amount of photons, actually, that show up uh, in each of the color bands. And uh, so we have to make a mapping from the thing that we're kind of interested in, DEM, to what I call the spectra. That's probably a strong word, since there's only seven color bands. But the distribution of, of, the, of the color, or the energy, or the wavelength. Uh, of the light that's uh, coming from that particular pixel. Uh, the subscript I on both the DEM and the spectra uh, is referring to the pixels, right? So we'll have some millions of pixels, uh, and each of them has their own uh, uh, DEM in principle. Um, and this matrix A uh, is really does the lion's share of the mapping between lambda and mu, the DEM and the spectra, where you can think of the columns of A as telling you what the uh, expected counts would be if the plasma were homogeneous in terms of its temperature. So if it were all at one constant temperature, what would the, what would the spectrum look like? Um, and then there's, of course, exposure, uh, uh, an exposure map or exposure matrix that kind of corrects for, uh, you know, different exposure times or such things between the different uh, color band uh, uh, photon counts. Okay, and so what we want to do is, you know, we have data now that is, it has expected counts equal to this lambda. And from the lambda, we want to learn about the mu's. And then, you know, we do that for all the pixels in principle, and then we do some sort of uh, uh, classification to segment the image into regions with similar uh, uh, DEM. That's, the, that's our goal. Now, that's kind of fine, except neither of those things are very easy to do. In particular, it's very hard to estimate mu from lambda. Uh, even if you had a complete spectrum, that would be a difficult thing to do. But our spectrum is very low resolution, right? We only have these seven bands. So, uh, and the A matrix is not, you know, it's not an invertible matrix. Even if lambda were much bigger, it wouldn't be an invertible matrix. It's certainly not invertible because it's, you know, some seven by, you know, the, the, the length of the, the DEM, which is, you know, hopefully more than seven. Um, so we can't really do that first step. So uh, what we are going to do instead is to make an observation which is kind of a simple observation, that is if I have two pixels with the same DEM, uh, they'll also have the same expected counts. They don't have the same counts, but they'll have the same expected counts. So we'll find it much, much easier to invert those two steps that I just described. So rather than first estimating the DEM for each pixel and then segmenting the image based on which uh, you know, based on the fitted DEM, I'm going to first segment the image based on the, you know, fitted spectra and then compute or estimate the DEM in some way for each of a much smaller number of, of segments of the image rather than the millions of pixels in the image. So that's going to be our overall strategy. Um, it turns out it's trivial to estimate the lambda uh, from the data. Uh, and what we're going to want to estimate even more than the lambda is the proportion of counts that correspond to each of the color bands. Um, first of all, you estimate the lambda just by the, the counts. That's easy. Um, the, fitted count, the fitted lambda is just equal to the counts. And then I'm going to take those fitted counts and I am going to divide by their sum to get the MLE, the maximum likelihood estimate of the proportion of counts. So, 
Uh, that's, that's what this is. So yi is going to be the, the six or seven numbers, the counts for each of the pixels. And this is kind of a you know odd little notation there if you're not familiar with it, but it's just it's just it's essentially just the sum of the yi. So I'm going to make this a, a, a probability vector, a vector that sums to one. And I'm going to uh, use this notation quite a bit, so it's probably worth just seeing what it is here. So a, a general p norm is going to be the sum of the elements of the vector to the pth power, and then you take the pth root of that. So more familiar is like the distance formula, right? So the, the, the length of a vector would be uh, 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 have p replaced by 2. And that is, this notation is saying that's, that would be the distance between y, the y vector, and 0. Okay, so that's a, we'll just kind of keep that notation in mind because we'll come back to that. Go ahead. Is the DEM a scalar value for each pixel? What's the vector? Uh, DEM is a vector. What are the elements of each thing in the vector? Uh, this one here? DEM, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's the, the expected count due to plasma at a particular temperature and then different temperatures. Okay. Yeah. So you think of it as a distribution of the temperature, yeah. And it's, it's uh, uh, on a grid. Um, okay, so that's that. So how are we going to? How are we going to? Now, now that you know, we estimate these uh, uh, these uh, proportions in each of the pixels. How are we going to do the classification? Well, that part is where we can get in. You know, get our our uh, kind of our basic off the shelf methods. So we're going to use what's called the k-means algorithm, a really standard method for clustering. And what the k-means algorithm does is it assigns units, which is in this case the fitted pies for each of the pixels, um, to clusters by minimizing the Euclidean distance to the centroid. Okay, so that is to say I'm going to have a, a number, say 10 or 20 uh, clusters uh, of uh, or regions or segments of the sun. And each of them is going to have an, an average, a centroid, of the, uh, uh, the spectrum uh, for pixels that are in that uh, uh, region. And I'm going, to just, I'm going to take all my pixels and I'm going to say for each pixel I'm going to put it in the, the region or the segment of the sun that has the centroid most near it in terms of the Euclidean distance. Now once I've done that, now I have all the pixels assigned to different segments and they're not necessarily uh, 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 coherent segments are not necessarily spatially coherent. They can, they're just a, a group of pixels. Once I have them in, in the segments, I'm going to update the centers by uh, finding the center that is, has the minimum Euclidean distance uh, to all of the pixels, the minimum, minimum total Euclidean distance to all the, t uh, the, the, the pixels in that cluster. And that turns out, if you're using the L2 norm like this, or Euclidean distance, uh, that turns out to be just the average. So it's very simple. K means you, it, you know, it races away. You can do this kind of classification very simply, or quickly, simply and quickly. Um, okay, so that's fine. But then as a statistician, we're always interested in scale. So one of the things we might you like to say, or we like to say, is that Euclidean distance is a sensible thing for kind of a, a real valued function, a real valued object, where you know, uh, you know, distances to the left and distance to the right are all kind of equally distant. But if you have a strictly positive quantity, um, distances to the left and right, especially if you're near zero, uh, are kind of asymmetric. There's a difference between those two things. So a Euclidean distance doesn't make, quite make sense. In this case, what we're looking at is not, they are positive quantities, but they're more than that. They're probability vectors. They're, all, they're vectors of numbers between zero and one that sum to one. So the Euclidean distance seems like a, a bit of an odd choice to us. So we uh, thought about replacing the Euclidean distance with what's called the Hellinger distance which is a distance that is, uh, uh, has a lot of nice statistical properties that I won't go into, but it's basically a distance between probability distributions, okay? And so, because these, these spectra are like probability distributions, they're discrete probability distributions or a probability vector, it makes sense to use the Hellinger distance instead. And so here's a formula for the Hellinger distance. I, rather than using the Euclidean distance up here, we use the Hellinger distance down here. And if you look at that, it doesn't really look all that different. The one half isn't going to make any difference at all. It's just part of the definition of the Hellinger distance. Uh, but essentially, we're going to be using the square root instead of the, op, the, the, the numbers themselves. Okay. And because it's relatively close, we can build another algorithm like k-means that's equally easy to implement, but that will be minimizing the Hellinger distance instead of the, uh, the, the Euclidean distance, and uh, everything's in closed form and simple and fast again. 
Okay, so just taking it on faith that that's a reasonable thing to do, what happens? So uh, I have a couple of images here of the sun. This is from the first work we did on this. This is already four years old. In the next slide, I'll get to the more recent bit. Uh, and so on the left-hand side is just, a, op, uh, just an image of the sun, optical image. And on the right-hand side is the, the, the classification or the segmentation of the pixels. And uh, it's on a gray scale that's, uh, 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 so, you know, pixels that are the same gray scale are in the same segment. And you can see again that it's the, there's nothing about the nearbyness of the pixels that uh, 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 encourages them to be in the same segment. It's just about their spectra or their thermal uh, properties. And one, uh, uh, the kind of the cool thing that jumped out to us was this kind of big S, this kind of twist, what looks like it's representing some sort of twisting of the, uh, the magnetic field. Okay, and as over time, you can see that the, 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 oops, what am I doing? <laughs> the feature is kind of uh, stable there. Okay, so that's kind of cool, and that was a, 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 you know, it made us think that maybe this Hellinger distance was a reasonable thing to do, and this whole process was a reasonable thing to do. We're getting something that might be a real structure uh, that's kind of popping out. Um, but it still, you know, seems, you know, we have reasons to think, you know, if you're going to pick something, pick Hellinger distance instead of Euclidean distance, but is it really the right thing to use? Is it really the right metric that we want to use? So more recently, uh, we tried to figure out, to do a little bit of work to kind of optimize that metric. Okay, so that's what I'll t discuss now. So this is something that's, that should appear in a few months. Um, so what, we've, what we do here is we are, are going to define a more general uh, uh, metric of distance between two pixels. And we're going to start with something that's called the cosine dissimilarity. And if you look at, it's kind of machine learning literature on uh, uh, image segmentation, the cosine dissimilarity function is all over the place. Uh, so it seemed like a good place to start. And uh, this function is kind of closely related to the, the things that we discussed already, the, the Euclidean and the Hellinger distance. So let me explain that. So what I have here is, again, my um, this, this distance is going to be the distance between two pixels. And uh, this time, I'm going to divide them by their uh, L2 norm, which means essentially I'm just going to divide them by their length. And so I'm turning them into unit vectors. Okay, so I take those two things. Rather, remember, with a, before we were dividing not by their length, but by their sum. So they weren't unit vectors, but they were probability vectors. Now I'm turning them into unit vectors, which are different, but, you know, not so different. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I am going to allow transformations of the data before I apply the cosine dissimilarity. So I'm going to take my y, and I'm going to transform it in the simple way. I'm going to, allow, I'm going to add a constant, and I'm going to take uh, the result to a power. Okay, and there's a couple of reasons why both of those things seemed sensible, but before I get to that, let's just make sure we understand what that means. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to transform the data in this way, those pi hats in this case, the, 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 the spectral data, and I'm going to then apply this cosine dissimilarity uh, uh, metric. So I'm going to apply the d, d cost to the, the transformed uh, pi hats, okay? And so that, what that does is it gives me a family of dissimilarities uh, that are indexed by gamma and uh, uh, beta. And I'm going to try to find the particular gamma and beta that does the best job with my data. OK. Um, so why, why this form? Well, taking, beta to a, taking a power like beta makes sense because that's kind of related to the Hellinger distance. Remember, it took the, the original pi's and took the square root. So I'll get something like Hellinger distance as a special case and something like Euclidean distance as a special case. And then adding a constant like this is a very standard thing to do with low count data. So if you're a Bayesian and you put a prior distribution and you're trying to figure out like what proportion of the counts come from backgrounds, you have background counts and source counts, and you just have a handful of counts, like you know, less than 10, a standard thing would, to do would be to add a constant to uh, both the background and the source. So that as you were estimating the proportion, it wouldn't be just background over total, it would be background plus one, say, over total plus two. 
uh, which is a, maybe at first blush a strange thing to do, but it turns out there's lots of reasons in low count situations why that estimate has better, better properties. And Bayesians and people who are not Bayesians agree uh, for different reasons that, that those estimates are better estimators. And you know, if people would come at from the problem from different points of view and come to the same, same conclusion, usually I think it's probably, the, it's probably a good thing to do. Of course, if, if you have lots and lots of counts, adding one doesn't make any difference. But if you have a small number of counts, it can make quite a difference. So we want to allow for that possibility as well. OK, so how, do we, how are we going to choose the beta and the gamma? So for a given, beta and gamma, a, a given beta and gamma determines a partition of the pixels. And so how is that going to work? If, you, if I told you beta was 1 and gamma was 1, you could then apply k-means again because the, the cosine distance is very much like the uh, Euclidean distance. You can transform the data and just use k-means, so it's easy to implement. And then you have the, the, uh, 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 the partition. And within each partition, you're going to say each, uh, uh, all of the pixels have the same spectrum. So you're going to kind of pool the pixels and estimate their pi hat, their, their spectrum. And you could also go ahead and do the DEM there as well. OK, so for one, for a given beta and gamma, I'm all set. So what am I going to do to choose the beta and gamma? Well, I'm going to use what's something called Bayesian decision theoretic approach. And what that means is I'm going to, I'm going to come up with a loss function which is a measure of distance between the true spectrum and the estimated spectrum. Okay, in this case, for example, I just use, again, the distance formula, squared error loss, between uh, the truth and the estimate. But, I, you know, that's a, that's a theoretical quantity because I don't know the real pi, and I don't want this, you know, I know pi hat for any particular pixel, but I want, I'm trying to say that this will, I want a method that will be good for all pixels. So, you know, I don't really know either of these things. Right? So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to be a <clears throat> kind of a statistician and find the expected value. I'm going to average over all possible values of the data and all possible values of the parameter using the sampling distribution the, that we have, so what, what the model that we've imp uh, imposed for the data, and a prior distribution that says something about the kinds of DEMs that we think are likely. So the risk and the Bayes risk <clears throat> are taking expected values first over the data and then over the parameters. And then what I get is a function that depends only on uh, uh, beta and gamma. That phi is superfluous. So, go ahead. Uh, so just going back a little bit, you haven't mentioned how you determine the number of clusters to... I haven't mentioned that. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 it's the kind of thing that I can, I can say a little bit about. So we think of that as not a particularly a statistical question, but more of a question of it's like what resolution you're going to look at the data, right? Because really we believe that the DEM, I mean, we don't really believe these clusters are any sense, in any sense real. We don't really believe there are segments of the sun that have exactly the same DEM. Right? Instead, we think that you know you could say they're all different, and then you don't get anywhere. Or you can find you look for regions that have similarities, but exactly how many you're going to say are there really depends on kind of how much detail you want to look at. So we'll you know we'll typically I can give you an, I can I can show you an example at the end, if I hopefully, we'll um, sh kind of show you the effect of using kind of experimenting with that variable. But I'm not going to give you an answer to like which one is right. For that point, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, this tells me how you know the, the theoretical way to kind of come up with the best beta and gamma. The only thing that's left is I have to be able to approximate or estimate this beta as a function of gamma, uh, 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 this Bayes risk as a function of beta and gamma. Uh, and so I'm going to do that via Monte Carlo. So just very quickly, we come up with a subjective prior on the DEM, which you can you know there's some details about that at the bottom there. But uh, I'm not going to go into that, but that's kind of, you know, because it's, again, not a statistical question, but, uh, you know, what we think are likely patterns for the DEM. We generate DEMs uh, according to that prior distribution. And if I have a DEM, I can then compute the lambda, and I can compute the pi and using the formulas for earl from earlier on. And then if I, if, I, if I have these parameters, I can sample a data set. And then if I have the parameters and the data set, then it's easy to compute this thing here and average it and average. So I essentially do that for a, on a fine grid of beta and gamma, and I get a map of the Bayesian loss as a function of beta and gamma. Okay, so that's just a Monte Carlo kind of exercise. 
Um, and so let's see what it looks like. Um, so this is a, a map of the Bayes loss as a function of beta and gamma. And I've done this for two different simulations. So it's a, it, we've simplified things a little bit for the, for the purposes of the simulation. We have 100 pixel images, each of them with uh, two clusters. And uh, the clusters have either, are either homogeneous or heterogeneous. Homogeneous meaning uh, that all of the pixels in the clusters are exactly the same. So in that case, there really are two, you know, two's the real answer. Uh, but uh, because that seems a little silly for the real, for a real problem, we, we, in the second setup, the, the, the two clusters have different average DEMs, but the DEMs within each cluster vary a little bit, okay? And when we do that, um, we can, we can, again, plot the, the, the Bayes risk, and you can see that the optimal values are slightly different. There's beta on the x-axis and gamma on the y-axis. Slightly different, but they're quite similar. Um, and the hill is kind of flat at the top, so if you move this thing around a little bit, you don't get a very, things don't change enormously. So it gives us a pretty good idea of the values of beta and gamma to use. Now, another thing we can, that's worth looking at is that we can compare this to the k-means algorithm and the h-means algorithm that we used in the earlier work, because both uh, the Euclidean distance and the uh, Hellinger distance, Hellinger distance is exactly a special case of this. Euclidean distance is nearly a special case of this. And they correspond to values down here where there's no gamma. So gamma is equal to zero. And beta is equal to one for Euclidean distance way over here. And Hellinger distance improves. It's going in the right dis direction, but doesn't quite get to the right place. OK, so we're over here. So we're going to do, in principle, uh, it looks like we should do better than either of those original methods, OK? in either case. Right. So that's kind of cool. Um, and, and we can see also that Hellinger, as we saw before, Hellinger distance, as we expected, we didn't see it before, but as we expected, Hellinger was better than Euclidean. Okay. Uh, this is the RAN index, uh, another measure. Instead of using the Bayesian uh, kind of analysis, Bayesian decision theoretic, theoretic analysis, RAN index is kind of like a computer science -y sort of thing to do, completely uh, fine thing to do, but not quite so statistical. And that is just to say, well, you know, I know the true classification because it's a simulation, so why don't I just compare the fitted classification with the true classification? And essentially, you, you look at all the pairs of pixels, and for every pair of pixels, they should either be in the same cluster or a different cluster. And you find uh, which proportion of them are co correctly, correctly um, uh, classified in that way. So if they are in the same cluster, uh, you mark it in, as a success. If they're classified as the same cluster, if they're actually in different clusters, you mark it as a success if they're in different clusters uh, in, your, in your fitted classification. And of course, failures in the other two cases. Uh, and you can see again, uh, you know, the, the, the best fits are slightly different, but, it, but they're not that different. We get, a, again, a, a pretty good, a pretty consistent uh, kind of result here. And what I think is kind of most interesting here is that in the homogeneous case, we actually get a RAN index of 92.5%, which means that 92.5% of the pairs of pixels are, cor are, are, are correctly either in the same or different uh, uh, clusters. So that's kind of nice. It's a little easier problem because, you know, the model's exactly right because the model is saying that the clusters are, you know, the same. Uh, in, in actuality, the clusters, you know, are not quite the same. That RAN index goes down a little bit. Uh, but if we just applied k-means on the raw data, it would go all the way down to 8 or 6 percent for these two cases here. So uh, just using the off-the-shelf kind of data science uh, all-purpose algorithm, leads to kind of disastrous results, whereas, you know, trying to incorporate the science, but still using that algorithm because it's speedy, but thinking very carefully about what you're going to feed into that algorithm and how you're going to interpret it, you get kind of significantly better results. Hey, David. Uh-huh. Up here. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'm not completely clear on what you're using for the RAND index. You have some criteria by which you say it's correctly or not correctly. So there's because it's a simulation, we know, we, know, we know the truth, right? Oh, okay. Right. So for... We know for each pair of pixels if they are actually in the same cluster or not. And then we look at the fitted one and see, make that same comparison. Of course, in a real data set, we couldn't do that. So, but it's just simulation so far. OK, so now let's go to the real data. So this is the same data set that I had on that first slide. And you can see there's this nice coronal hole at the bottom. And uh, just as a full disclosure, the reason we picked this particular date 
was because when I was, we were making this example uh, for the paper, that's the day it was. <laughs> so it was the, the day, or maybe it was two days before. It was the, it was the most recent data that, was, that we could download off the web on the day that I, it came time to you know, do this analysis. So, uh, and it had this nice hole. We got, so we got a little lucky with that. And so we're going to look a little more closely at that hole at the bottom. Um, and so what's going on here is I have, mm, on the left-hand side, this is our fit. And the right-hand side is just applying k-means. And what the, the difference that you want to see is that k-means has these kind of strong horizontal stratification. Um, and very strong lines that go uh, along this, this, this edge of the, the coronal hole, whereas uh, our fit, things are a lot kind of, it's a lot smoother going down, and you see kind of a lot more structure at the bottom here. And we want to look at this particular bulb at the bottom here, because we, you know, we just kind of did this and showed it to Vinay, and he was kind of interested in that little bulb because it looked like, you know, something was about to pop. So um, what we did was we went back and looked at that, you know, this is the image of the sun actually a half an hour later, and you can see in that same spot there was an ejection right after that. So that's not quite enough data to, you know, say we can predict this kind of structure because it's only, you know, a single analysis. But it's in fact the only analysis we did, and, we, and it kind of popped out that way, so we were kind of psyched about that. Uh, you know, we'd like to do something a little bit more systematic, but it's a little tricky to figure out how to do that, so we haven't gotten to that yet. Oh, they're just, they're just arbitrary. Because the, what we, we have, in this case, there's 20 classes, and, uh, but they're not ordered in any way. So, the, so, so all the red things are similar to all the red things. That's right. They, so those, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you, there are 20 colors. And you say there should be not. 20 colors, yeah. It's a little hard to count them. <laughs> but yeah, there should be 20 colors. Is that what I said there? Yeah, 20 clusters, yeah. So um, I, since I'm running out of time, uh, the last thing I want to do is show you, um, you know, this, everything I've done here so far is on static images. What we really want to do is to see how these, these clusters evolve over time. Uh, and so what we do for that is we have a, a kind of a, a data cube, so the image of the sun at different time epochs. And we apply exactly the same method. And so we get clusters not only spatially but temporally. So let me show you that quickly, and then we will I'll stop for pizza and or questions. Yeah. So this is an image of the sun that it's about to, you can see that, uh, what is it? A prominence, <laughs> which I wanted to call an eruption that's going on there. And so there's 32, I think, 32 frames here. And um, I'll play it one more time. And if you watch, you, this one doesn't have the frames numbered, but it's around frame 15 if you're counting, <laughs> where the, it starts to go. Okay, and it's past 15 where it really goes like this. Okay. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm, I took exactly this, you know, not this data, right, because we have our different color bands and all that. Uh, but we did the classification, and let me start with this one. Let me see. Yeah, it's a little weird. Um, and at the same time, let me just get this. So this is that. So this is a single frame. So you can get, kind of get the structure. Before I let the, this thing play, just to make sure you have some sense of what you're seeing here, because the colors don't have any meaning. Uh, this here is the edge of the sun, right? And this business over here is kind of the, the hot plasma. And you know, by eye, you know, this looks to me. I don't know. To me, <laughs> this looks the same as this, really, all of that. But we're picking up that there, there's definitely a, a difference or something else going on here than there is, you know, kind of in the edges here. And uh, I stopped on frame 17 there just because I couldn't catch it. But let's watch it now from the beginning. Oh, so fast. Yeah, once I stop it, it gets my little thing confused. So let me let it run through without actually. Now we go. Okay. And you can see around frame 15, there are these two features show up, and then they're going to kind of grow into this explosion of prominence. Oops, and then they go so fast. It's like, <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. It is real player. I should be doing something else. I, can't. I don't have a lot of control over this thing, but if I just don't touch it, it's a little better. You can see that. There it goes, right? And this is with uh, 32. 
And you know, we you can we can do things with different. Uh, you know, this is only what is this now? 16. Same thing happens, but you don't get quite as much detail. But so again, you're, you're still seeing the same structure. It's just a question of resolution, right? And let me just show you the 64. Right there, there it goes again. Okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's still, you know, this is now. This is, you know, these are the files that Vinay helped me with at seven o'clock this morning. So, <laughs> <laughs> that is to say, you know, we're not quite sure exactly how to take this forward. We're, we're still working on it. Uh, you know, it'd be nice if there would be if we put some kind of content into that coloring, right? Because right now, like I said, they're just kind of random colors. Uh, so that doesn't, you know, so it's harder, you know, the colors don't aid you in picking up uh, uh, any information there. Um, but uh, in the long run, uh, you know, again, what we want to try to do is to be able to, you know, get a handle on how these structures uh, evolve over time. So let me stop there since we're, I'm supposed to stop now. <laughs> it says 11.45, so thank you for your attention. <laughs> Oh, right there. Yeah. It's, it's a making the picture issue. <laughs> Sorry. So it's not actually changing. No, yeah, without, I didn't, cluster. yeah. Maybe I shouldn't have shown that 64. That's the only one that that happens in. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if it happened in the lower resolution one. Yeah. I think it's, we think it's just an error in the image, yeah. Anything else? Oops. Oh right. So I, I haven't shown you that. Uh, yeah. So what the idea is to in each of the segments to go and map the DEMs. You know, use you know maybe a Bayesian analysis, a, a, a kind of an expensive Bayesian analysis to go back and estimate those DEMs. So it's it's possible, but the, 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 the you know the idea is that now we, we have to do a lot fewer of those DEM reconstructions than we would have done had to have done otherwise. Oh, you mean the one on the left? Sorry. Well, that's it's, it's my real player. It's like it's it's not very forgiving. Okay, now it should be able to do it. Oh, uh, uh, you want me to? What do you want me to do? Say it again. Click on one of the the kids. Sixteen. And space bar. Yeah. What? Click away. Click what? No space bar. You wanted to open it a different, a different, a different. Oh, oh, like so. Oh, wow, that's kind of cool. Oh, that looked nice, yeah. Right there.
Yeah. Like this, like you can see that moving following the sun right here. Right, and we would want to definitely like measure the number, the counts that we're using out there before we were, you know. Variability. So, do you have any idea of a vision for kind of how to use that knowledge to improve the algorithm? I mean, it seems like it'd be nice if you could take into account the fact that things are not just random clusters, but there is physics that is indirectly driving these. Um, so, you, you mean that, that there's variability within the clusters? Mm -hmm. They are pretty similar, potentially slightly different or something. Right. And uh, you know, there should be some way to leverage the fact that you know the DEMs are not just random vectors, but they have some kind of structure. Oh right, right. So we're not we're not. I mean, one of the things we tried to avoid was to specify. I mean, we put priors on the DEMs for that for the purposes of picking the gamma and the beta. But once we're actually doing the data analysis and have the gamma and the beta, we're not making any assumptions about their shape. Um, so we were, that was kind of purposeful because we felt that there's not a lot of agreement about what, what's a good way to kind of parameterize or put structure into them. On the other hand, of course, like anything else, if you can put structure on, onto them, uh, you'll, you know, you'll, you know, leverage, you'll, you'll have a lot more power to, to leverage things. Uh, it, similarly, you know, you see these big clusters here. There's nothing, there's nothing in our algorithm that says that this shouldn't be just like uh, static. Yeah. It's, um, you know, because there's, we don't, the distance between pixels is not in the algorithm at all. So the fact that we get these big s regions with similar, that are single, s similar segments is completely from the data. So that was kind of our goal was to have it, you know, that, you know, completely from the data. But once you kind of, you know, get a sense of what kind of models you're willing to put down, then you can, you can, you'll have a lot more power. There's, there's some extra information there, but probably doesn't multiply as fast as the pixels, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can continue this conversation over pizza. Uh, let's thank our speaker again, though. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. And you should grab pizza. Before it's too late. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, it's probably better to ask actually some of the people over there that question, but I think if you could have higher resolution, if you actually had spectra, oh, you have your microphone. oh yeah. It'll cut off, but yeah. yeah, if you actually had spectra instead of like seven color bins. <laughs>